Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to introduce Professor Ronald Fernando Garcia Ruiz from MIT as our colloquium speaker. Ronald received his bachelor's degree from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia, his master's from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and his PhD from KU Leuven. Ronald's research centers around performing precision spectroscopic measurements of atoms and molecules containing exotic, unstable, and extreme nuclei. These species enable very detailed and sensitive studies of a wide range of physics, including nuclear structure and properties, the fundamental forces, and searches for new sources of fundamental symmetry violation. Ronald has won many awards, including, but not limited to a DOE Early Career Award, a CERN Research Fellowship, uh, the IOP Nuclear Physics Group Early Career Prize, uh, and the European Physical Society Nuclear Physics Division Thesis Award. Please join me in virtually welcoming Ronald, who we will definitely invite back in person at some point in the hopefully not too distant future. Uh, Ronald, please take it away. Thank you very much, Nick, for this kind introduction. And indeed, so I would love to, to go to Caltega and to visit your labs and, and to know more about the work that all of you are doing. So I'm very happy to show you some of the work that we are doing in creating this and study these atoms and molecules. And the main speciality of our group is that we can modify the, the protons and neutrons inside these molecules. And this is very interesting because by adding or removing a, a nucleon, we can access to very different nuclear phenomena. And we will see some specific examples why, why it's interesting and how we can contribute to understand the main open question, questions of nuclear science. But one highlight here is that once we remove neutrons or protons in a nucleus, they became, or normally they became, they become unstable. And the lifetimes can be as short as a few days or a fraction of a second. And solving this problem, trying to measure these properties in such a short-lived nuclei has been one of the main contributions of our group and collaborators. So why it's interesting, so by itself, uh, all of these phenomena is very rich in many, in many body physics, right? So the, the nucleus is the, the stronger, the strong correlated many body problem. So one of the main goals of nuclear science is to make a description of nuclei uh, related with uh, QCD, right? We like to start from QCD and make a description of all of these nuclear phenomena. And this is interesting not only for nuclear physics, but for many physics communities that need theoretical nuclear physics to uh, the disentangle or to get the nuclear, uh, the fundamental physics observables. And it's part of our interest to connect our knowledge of nuclei with the knowledge of nuclear matter. As I tell to the students, we cannot create a neutron star in a lab, of course, but what we can do is we can add many neutrons into a nucleus and by understanding the properties of this very neutron rich nuclei, we hope we can guide our knowledge to understand neutron rich matter like neutron stars. And if we add enough neutrons and protons, we can make a combination of protons and neutrons that create these nuclei, these heavy nuclei that are highly collective and have these asymmetric shapes that people know as optical deformed nuclei. Or, or pure shape nuclei. And the interesting part for us is that these, these asymmetric shapes amplify the violation of fundamental symmetries, in particular the time reversal symmetry that we know that uh, uh, violation of time reversal symmetry uh, beyond the current observations is a condition needed to explain the matter, antimatter asymmetry of the universe a main question of nuclear science, but also of, of science in general. And effectively what we are doing is we use atoms and molecules to study the electron nuclear interaction. And we are doing that with such a high precision that we can start thinking about or trying to rule out the existence of new forces, hopefully constraining the, the existence of dark matter, for example, 
and rather than from MIT or Ray K but talk based on this, how you can use atomic spectroscopy to constrain these possible new forces. Well, I will try to show in this presentation and I hope I can convince you is that by just modifying the nucleons, we can access to all of these questions of nuclear science. And by using atoms and molecules, we can actually explore this phenomena and provide direct answer to these questions. And to understand that, let me start with a, with a simple example, kind of back in a kind of cartoon picture. Imagine that you want to, to know what's inside a watermelon, that you, can, you don't know what's inside and you go and speak with a high energy physicist. And probably what he will tell us, he will design an experiment in which he's in a high energy particle to collide with this watermelon. And just by doing this collision, you can basically destroy the watermelon. And if you collect everything from this reaction, all the reaction products, and you repeat the experiment and again and again, and you, have, you are clearing the theoretical models that you use to rebuild the watermelon, then this kind of experiments probably will take you to, to make a reconstruction of the watermelon and really understand what's inside of the watermelon and how everything is, is together or bind together inside that. What we do in our lab is quite different. So we don't destroy the watermelon. We just put an electron around this watermelon and take advantage of quantum mechanics in the sense that we know that the electron wave function might have an overlap with the inside of this watermelon. Then by studying very precisely the electron properties, then we can get a, an idea of the structure and what's happening inside this watermelon. So these two different approaches to understand nuclei are known as the energy frontier, typically associated with, with colliders physics, large scale experiments, and their approach is the precision frontier, in which I can use tabletop experiments with high precision to access to nuclear properties. The interesting part as well is that they, they offer complementary information and particularly in the high precision frontier, we can in principle access to physics beyond the energy that you can get or access with colliders. So that's, I think that that will be the main idea. So if you go outside and say, what, what was discussed in this colloquium, you can say this guy used uh, atoms and molecules and modify the nucleus of these molecules to explore some of the most important questions in our understanding of the universe. So the, the overview for this talk will be, first I would like to, to show just in a general way how we do it, how we create these systems, how we study them, and I will present some results from our group and collaborators in the study of atoms and more recently molecules for fundamental symmetries. And it's time that, that we develop a technique of, of progress in the experimental side. Uh, we open new opportunities and they are becoming, we will see that this is a growing and very exciting field. So this is a collaboration between different uh, physics communities. So I mean, it's a truly interdisciplinary effort. Our main goal is nuclear science, but we use atomic and molecular physics. So it's a constant interaction between experimentalists and theorists from these different fields. So I have to thank to, to different people. This is of, what I will present is of course, not only my work, but the work of, of, of two different people, different collaborations. Those are the Collapse and Chris collaborations at uh, all the CERN collaborations with nuclear theory, atomic theory, and quantum chemistry. And here are some faces uh, of our group uh, at MIT. By the way, one of our students is a former uh, student from Caltech. So ideally, we would like a machine or a device that we can just write down the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and then create the system, right? This is, of course, far from reality. What we do in reality is we have to, to change or to remove a nucleon or to add a neutron. 
is a process that needs quite high energy beyond the MEV scale. So what we do is we use colliders to create this nuclei. So we can do an experiment like high energy protons colliding in, in a heavy nuclei like uranium, and then you produce a gas of many particles. So in this nuclear reaction, then you produce basically a gas of all that you can imagine, atoms, molecules, and nuclei. These kind of facilities are evolving quite fast. So we have done most of the experiments at CERN when we have access to high energy protons. There is a new facility here in US, one of the main UAE facilities, the facility for rare isotope beams at Michigan State University. And there is another facility in Canada at Trium. Those facilities we are, we are starting collaborations. And I should say many of these elements that we that are quite interesting for us. Oh, all of them are, you cannot find it in the planet, right? You really need these facilities to produce artificially. And in a sense, we are recreating a, a, a stellar explosion of, of the emergence of a neutron star, where places where you can find these elements. So now the challenges is that when you create the elements, you are just creating a gas of many particles in a very hot and highly contaminated environment. And typically the element that you want to study is produced in a very, in a very small amount. We are now exploring elements that are produced like one ion per second. And you need to, to be able to isolate this element from this large contamination. And typically the lifetimes can be very short, you know, a fraction of a second. And we need to do that with high precision, right? Those you know, overcoming these four main challenges has been the, the main contribution of, of our group and collaborators. How we do it in, 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 a, in a simplified scheme is once we produce these kinds of elements, we use a combination of lasers, multiple lasers and electromagnetic fields to isolate the element, the atom or the molecule that we want to study and separate from all of these and send into a, a tabletop setup where, where we can perform high precision experiments. And this tabletop like setup is a combination of, of traps, ion traps and lasers. And we do that atom by atom or molecule by molecule. So in a typical experiment, what we do is imagine we take a, an atom, we measure electron en energy levels, typically are electron volts. And experimentally what we see is just a peak with some frequency, right? That indicates this transition frequency of the atom. Now we can add neutrons into the nucleus of these atoms and there will be a shift in this electron energy level. And this small shift is what is known as the isotope shift. And it's interesting for us because although it's very small, typically 10 to the minus six electron volts, if we are able to measure it with high precision, this shift is proportional to a change in the size of the nucleus. And that's a typical experiment that we do. We just continue adding neutrons and see how the nuclear size change. Provided we can know the F here, that is a, an atomic or a molecular parameter that now we can calculate quite precisely for an atomic theory, or we can do independent experiments to, to access to this atomic or electronic structure. Now, if if the nucleus has a spin different than zero, then there will be an hyperfine splitting. And the size of this hyperfine splitting depends on the interaction between the nuclear magnetic moment interacting with the magnetic field produced by the electrons at the nucleus and the nuclear quadrupole moment interacting with the electric field gradient. And we can continue increasing and increasing the precision. At some point, and we will see a shift that corresponds to the interaction of the electron electron properties like the magnetic moment of the electron interacting with the effective magnetic fields. Or if there is an electron EDM, then it will interact with the defective field. Now, overall, in a nutshell, this is what we do from, from the experiment in this kind of in this kind of, of experiments is that we typically see a shift in either an electronic level in, in the atom or the molecule. And the amplitude or the size of the shift correspond to a product between a nuclear property and an at atomic or, or a molecular property. If we are interested in a particular nuclear phenomena, it can be 
nuclear structure or asymmetry violating property, then we can design the best atom or the best molecule that amplify this effect, right? That really split this line. And how well we can define these lines, this spectrum, it's our work as an experimentalist. So we need to, to get the best precision that we can get. And there are some fundamental limitations like the coherence time and the number of molecules that, that we can access to really define this shape. So that's the work that we do. In general, if you, we just create the nuclei to, a, to study a particular nuclear phenomenon. Okay, so by doing this work, we have been extending that to different atoms and different molecules. And I will show you some, some examples of what we can do and how we can contribute to, to different questions of, of nuclear science. So one main goal, as I said, is to find a, in nuclear physics is to find the, the standard model of the nucleus, right? So in many books of nuclear physics, you will read in the introduction that it's impossible to make a connection of nuclei with the fundamental forces, right? At least when I started my PhD, that, that was why I was taught. But there has been a tremendous progress during the last few years. Um, the progress has been mainly thanks to, to different developments, one, at least three different developments. One is the, the development of chiral effective field theory, right? An effective field theory that at least it has a connection or respect the symmetries of QCD. And the development of many body methods, right? The, the nuclear many body problem is, is, is a strongly correlated many body problem. We are working in, in a highly no perturbed regime of QCD. So it's a very hard problem to solve, but also the increase in computing power. And if you see the mass of nuclei that can be calculated, in this case, the binding energies with a precision better than 5%, you see over the years, there has been a, just a jump, a really rapid increase in the last two, three, five years. Now able to calculate of these ab initio many body methods, able to calculate nuclear properties in nuclei with up to 50 protons and 82 neutrons. Now we are working on those systems. So really is something that we thought a few years ago will be impossible. This sounds great, but unfortunately, all, no all nuclei can be calculated, right? There are some particular regions of the nuclear chart. By the way, for, for those that are not familiar with this chart, I just plot in the number of protons versus the number of neutrons. And the black points here are the, the stable nuclei that you find in nature. All our colors are unstable nuclei. So when you say, this theory, this sounds great that they can calculate heavy nuclei, but no all nuclei can be calculated, only a do around doubly magic nuclei or doubly or closed shells. This is a problem of just the many body method. So these regions here, you see, are far away from the black points, are far away from the, from the, from the stability. So that has been the main challenge that these nuclei that are the corner stones, the, really the benchmark for the development of nuclear theory are just very far away from stability. And this has been the main focus of our work that we started a few years ago, trying to understand these regions of the nuclear chart. And this is just summarizing a few of the results of the last, re, the, of the results of the last year that our group and collaborators have, provide, have provided. Right, many, many, almost any isotope of each isotope has a different history to tell us, very exciting results. I don't pretend to go to all of these results. I will just focus in some general, general uh, phenomena that we have seen and how it is challenging our understanding of, of neutron rich nuclei. And I will focus particularly in a region that is very close to my heart, the calcium region and the nickel region. And I will jump into the region of very heavy nuclei that are, that are of high interest for, for to study the fundamental symmetries. So actually I will only discuss the, what we know about the radius of the nuclei, but you will know that we can also measure different properties that are equally exciting, but just the radius is, is, is a nice example to show how we can contribute to, to different questions of nuclear science. If I plot the char radius difference of the root mean squared char radius is delta R squared, that is what we can actually measure directly 
with these experiments as a function of the neutron number for calcium isotopes to see this remarkable odd even staggering effect. It was very puzzling. And you start with calcium 40 that's stable and you add new neutrons and then you end with calcium 48, almost the same size that calcium 40. There were many theoretical developments that tried to explain that. Many, several of them very successful. And I just plotting here a few examples of the different theoretical developments. There are many more. Calcium is the battleground to, to develop theory because you can find different doubly magic structures. So they present this simplified structure that allow us to, to actually do predictions with high accuracy. And the attention in the neutron rich side is, it was highlighted because you see all the theory was able to do very good when, where data was known, there was a divergence far away from the stability. And there were indications from different observables that it kind of behaves as a doubly magic neutron, even for very neutron rich numbers, 52 or 54. And to our surprise, when we went and measure this radia, the size of the nuclei was growing far faster than we expected. So really challenging our understanding of the evolution of the nuclear size away from stability, right? Highlighting how poorly known is, is the, the, our knowledge of neutron rich matter. And we have done several works, not only with calcium, in the nickel, in the thin regions. And something that has been similar is that, or has been consistent is that we see similar patterns. So close to stability, there is the green line, in the green area here, we see a strong dependence of the nuclear size when you add neutrons, a strong dependence with the proton number. And once you cross the closed shell and you go to very neutron rich nuclei, they almost grow with the same slopes. And this is, has been a puzzle, right? To understand why you see, you suddenly see these very simple patterns of the nuclear size that we cannot explain yet from these ab initio theories. I summarize in here many years of the last years of work from our group and collaborators, but there are other groups that have now entering to measure the properties of neutron deficient nuclei. So in the view of an artist of physics that draw a highlight of, of the work is that yes, you increase, increase the number of neutrons, the nucleus grows slowly. Sometimes the size of the nucleus goes down and at some point it just span very fast. And I said, part of our understanding or our motivation is to understand nuclear matter, right? And some of the theories have highlighted that if we now combine our knowledge of neutron rich nuclei with neutron deficient nuclei that will be on the other side, then we can constrain very precisely, at least if we believe in this theoretical uh, suggestion, very precisely parameters of the equation of the state. And the idea, I will just go very fast through it, is that we can access to mirror nuclei. Mirror nuclei is that nuclei that I can replace the, the protons by neutrons and, and, and vice versa. And parameters of the equation of state, like symmetry energy of the slope of symmetry energy could be constrained by seeing the char radius difference between these two mirror nuclei of any mass. And here is an example for this nuclei where you can do this kind of plots, char radius difference of these two nuclei that we can measure in our lab precisely versus the slope of symmetry energy. And then by measuring this property, then we constrain all this slope of symmetry energy. And this can be competitive even with uh, gravitational wave observations or, or weak interaction studies like the uh, Jefferson lab, for example, the PREX experiment, which is an interesting suggestion. And why is it is, important to know or to constrain L because once the equation of the state is needed to do predictions, for example, in this case, the radius of a neutron star. Theories have been actually continue this work and saying, okay, you can actually constrain a radius of a neutron star directly by measuring the, the char radius difference between mirror and nuclei. Most of the has been theoretical developments because we know very little about neutron deficient nuclei partially because it's very difficult to access to this nuclei, but new facilities like EFRIP in the United States will allow us to access to this neutron deficient nuclei and more of these results hopefully 
finally we'll be able to, to explore this region of the nuclear chart in the next few years. So with that, I would like to jump to the second part of the presentation, that is the study of exotic molecules. But I would like to take a short break here to see if there is any questions about the, the study of atoms. Maybe we can just uh, save the questions to the end. Um, and if anyone does have questions uh, throughout the talk or at the end, um, you can use the, the, the Q&A um, or the chat or the raise hand feature and we'll try to keep our eyes open for it. Okay, please, yeah. So pl please feel free, I didn't say, but feel free to in interrupt me. So I will be happy to answer. Because now we will jump in, into the work with molecules. And in a cartoon, what we do is, so in, Atoms, we have well-defined orbits, right? Like the S, P, D, and so on. And orbits like the S, the electronic orbits in atoms, they have a kind of a good overlap with the center of the nucleus, but they have a spherical symmetry. So we, we mainly learn about the nuclear size, but if we want to learn something beyond the nuclear size, like the magnetic moment or the quadrupole moment, we have we have to go to higher orbits like P, D, and so on. We have to break this spherical symmetry. The price that we pay is that we lose overlap with the center of the nucleus. Now, when we put another atom next to it, so this is an example of radium, that the, the ground state is S, we put a fluor, the S orbit in the atom becomes a sigma orbit in the molecule. So as a result, now I have an electron orbit that is, has still a good overlap with the nucleus, but is deformed. So I can access then to properties, or I can get a, a deeper knowledge of what's happening inside the nucleus, and uh, particularly the, the short range electron nucleon interaction. So properties, for example, like the weak interaction, uh, the, the parity violation inside the nucleus, will create some, you can imagine a kind of tokamak currents where there is an effective magnetic field only inside the nucleus. Then the electron in these orbits can enter, interact with this magnetic field, this property is known as the anapole moment of the nucleus, and then the electron energy will be modified. And in principle, we can measure this precisely. For similar reasons, or, or and I will explain now, so you can easily polarize these molecules and create large effective fields that uh, people like Nick use to, to measure the electron EDMs. The bottom line here is that these effects scale very fast with the atomic number and the mass number to some power, right? Going to heavy nuclei, we maximize the sensitivity to all of these, uh, to the electroweak structure of nuclei that so far is poorly known. If you want to quantify this a bit better, if you don't include the weak interaction, orbits has, have, will have a well-defined parity, right? The weak interaction will mix atoms or molecular levels of different parity. And the amplitude of this mixing depends on the matrix element that connects the two from the weak interaction. And in the denominator, the energy difference between the states of different parity. In atoms, these energy difference are typically in the electron volt scale in molecules are about 10 to the minus five electron volts. So then naturally you, you just amplify this, this coefficient by around 10 to the five, just by going into the molecules. Now they are so close in energy that you can actually apply a, a, an external magnetic field to bring these two energies to close to zero. So you send this denominator to zero then you can have an enhancement of more than 10 to 11, as has been shown by the group of David Emil and, and, and company. So an enhancement of 10 is great. 10 to the five is, is wonderful. And 10 to the 11 is just, just telling us that what we thought that was impossible can become very possible with molecules. And as I said, for similar reasons, you can easily polarize these molecules and with a weak, external field, 
you can create a, a very large internal field in these molecules. Here, the example of thorium oxide, the field of the order of 80 gigavolts per centimeter. Nick has been working on that, how to, to use this to, to measure symmetry violating properties of the electron, in this case, the electron in the end, but also of the nucleus. So you have a, a large molecular enhancement just because you have this gigantic electric field. And why it's interesting to measure EDMs, I'm sure you have seen many talks about that. Let me just show one of these interesting plots. If I plot the electron EDM, the different bands here are different extensions of the standard model. And the different colors here indicate the different experimental constraints to this electron EDM. 20 years ago, atoms were the main players. Less than 10 years ago, molecules took over the field. And now uh, people have been using molecules to really improve our knowledge of this or to constrain the electron EDM, ruling out different extensions of the standard model and effectively testing physics at the TV scale and beyond. So very wonderful and exciting results in, in, in this topic. So we are mainly interested in the nucleus, right? That was the electron in the end. We're mainly interested in the nuclear properties that we can enhance because the nuclear, the symmetry violating properties in particularly this the equivalent of the nuclear EDM that will be the shift moment. I will not go into the details, but you can see like the, like the nuclear EDM will be proportional to the, the, the proton number to some power, the mass number, the quadruple and the optical deformation. And similarly, as in the electron, in the atom or the molecule, in the denominator, you have the energy difference between the states of different parity now of the nucleus. And you can maximize all of this at once using this optical deformed nuclei. The particularity is that these nuclei are radioactive, so they are exotic. You have to produce artificial. So then you can have enhancements of more than 10 to the three. And there are some cases like protactinia that people claim more than 10 to the five. And the idea is that that came to us, we said, okay, what happened if I now put this nucleus inside a molecule and take advantage of both the molecular and the nuclear amplification. So these exotic molecules really, at least on paper, take the very best of all worlds. But no, everything is easy, right? Those are poorly known. When we started our work, it was basically no knowledge about these exotic molecules. So, and this motivated us to start with the work. And we started with the molecule with dryon fluoride. And what I'm going to show you is our, our first results from a couple of years ago. This has been also new for us. And to start mean that we really need to measure all properties of the molecule. If you plot in atoms, we are, we are mainly working with two levels. In molecules, we have many degrees of freedom, so electronic, also vibration, rotation, and hyperfine structure. And we need to measure part by part, really to understand the, the structure of the molecule. And each time that you jump into a degree of freedom, you are jumping by two or three orders of magnitude in precision. So radium fluoride is quite special because radium is this nucleus with this enhancement of symmetry violating nuclear properties, but the radium fluoride, the molecule itself enhanced the molecular part. And it has an interesting and especially interesting property. And is that although you have many levels, it's a very dense level system in, mol in a molecule, effectively it can work as a two level system. So this molecule was predicted to be good for laser cooling. So because you can excite a transition with a laser and it decays mainly or it comes back mainly to the same state. So in the language of quantum chemistry, the Frank condom factors are highly diagonal and it was predicted. So there was a further motivation to, to start with these molecules. Now, laser cooling is fairly new. It's a very well-known feeling in atoms. Molecules it started no long ago, let's say 10 years ago, and it has been progressing, uh, evolving quite fast, but still there are many developments that are going on. How we do this, how, how did we do this experiment? 
So we start, as I said, we, we need to produce this exotic element, this exotic nuclei. We do that with a high energy proton accelerator at CERN. We produce the gas, we collide the protons with, with uranium. We produce this gas, this hot gas of different elements. We send CF4 to guide the chemistry and produce hopefully mainly radium fluoride plus or, or radium fluoride molecules. And then we play with the temperature of the target and some parameters to enhance the yield of radium fluoride. At the same time, we are producing many more contaminants. So we need to separate them using electromagnetic fields. We send the radium fluoride into an ion trap filled with a gas, with a helium gas at room temperature that we use to cool down the molecular ion. So now this is called for us, you know, for a normal AMO person, they would say room temperature is just very hot, but you have to see that we are starting from a truly extreme environment, very hot environment. But room temperature is enough for us to perform a measurement. So now we take, we use this trap to bunch, to cool and bunch the molecular ion. We are mainly interested in the neutral molecule that has these, you know, these special properties so then we need to give an electron to radium fluoride plus. We do that by colliding with a neutral gas. And once it's neutralized, we send different laser beams that will interact with this molecule. And at the end, we can put a, a, an electromagnetic field that deflects or separate neutral molecules from molecules that are being ionized. And the idea is that we need to send at least two lasers, one to try to find the transition that we need to measure to scan uh, and be able to find these transition energies. And a second laser that is a very powerful with a fixed frequency, but hopefully will take the electron from the excited state and will ionize the molecule. So in a typical experiment, then the molecules come, get neutralized. If there is no, if the first laser is outside of resonance, then the second laser do nothing, right? Then the neutral molecule continues as a neutral molecule. Now, here we see the, what's gonna happen in the detector that is uh, located at some angle, we'll see no counts, right? Zero background, hopefully. And at some point when we scan the laser, the first laser, right, this first one, at some point, the first laser we, when it's in resonance will excite the electron energy level and the second laser will have enough energy to ionize the molecule. Then now the molecule gets deflected and we see an increase in counts in our detector. So conceptually very simple, right? And the idea is that we can do that with extremely high efficiency, almost atom or molecule by molecule. And the, that sounds conceptually very simple, but almost any part was an open question in the experiment, right? We didn't know how many molecules we we're going to produce and if they were actually going to survive all of these, yeah, all of these uh, phenomena, right? You inject high energy into a trap, then you have to neutralize in flight, and then you have to to scan the laser, but we don't, we didn't even know what was the transition energy, right? So everything was new with this molecule. I will not go through all the details that allow us to measure the properties of this molecule. Let me, let me jump into the important results. So we are able to measure the electronic and vibrational structure and verify that it has all the right properties to do laser cooling. In the words of one of our postdocs, we are proving that these hot molecules, right, can be super cool, that we can, we can do laser cooling. And in the big picture, we are just starting to know the structure of the molecule. So there are many, a lot of work to be done to to actually measure the parity or PT violating properties. But we are working in this direction. Uh, by the way, so we published that recently and we were very happy to know, we are very pleased to know that it called the attention not only from physics communities, but also from, from the chemistry community. So now I will jump into the second part that is now that we know how to create the molecule and study the molecule, we can play the games that we know how to play add neutrons into the nucleus of one of these molecules and then see what happened with the structure of the molecule. And it has been interesting because we see these big changes, these big, big isotope shifts that are dominated by the short range electron nucleon interaction. So we can have a, a deep knowledge of how the electron interacts at the nucleus. 
which is important not only for nuclear physics, but also for, uh, for fundamental symmetries. Okay, more of this to come. So the, the students that have been analyzing this work, as I said, and knowing how the electrons or what the electron wave function of the nucleus can also be a path to understand the, the, the nuclear structure of these elements like actinides that technically are very hard to extract as an atoms, but are might be easier to extract or to create as molecules. More of that to come. And in terms of high precision, <coughs> as I said, we are just at that moment, we're just measuring the, up to the vibrational levels. So now we are able to, to go and actually span one of these regions and do with higher precision and be able to, to measure the rotational spectrum. And we can now add neutrons or remove neutrons to one of the nucleus and create something like radium 223 fluoride with an hyperfine splitting. And now we are at the point that we can measure the hyperfine splitting in, in those molecules. So we're jumping in very close to, to our long-term goals. But of course the jump between now our precision and actually doing symmetry by latent measurement is still challenging. So there are still many developments and we are working in, in, with, in collaboration with Nick, our host, uh, to go towards these goals. Okay, many opportunities. It's a very exciting field. This is just the beginning. Uh, I presented you the nuclear chart, every the new facility in, in US is going to give us access to the light nuclei. And these are poorly known so far, are very rich in many body physics. They are critical to connect our knowledge of nuclei with QCD. So, and finally, we're able, we will be able to produce these facilities. We are developing the techniques to access to, to all of these nuclei. And at the very extreme, EFRI will be also very good to produce actinine nuclei. And these actinine nuclei are very important for nuclear structure, as I said, to understand the, the, the emergence of this collective phenomena in nuclei and the development of optical deformation. This is linked to the, to the studies of fundamental symmetries, right? The historian oxide molecules and actinides are, are very interesting for that but also they have many technological applications. So these atoms and these molecules of actinides. There are many more molecules that we will be able to produce in, in these facilities. We are very excited. So the next few years will, will really open a new chapter in, in, in this region of the nuclear chart. And there are different theoretical proposals to measure different symmetry violating properties. I would like to highlight here the work that from you and Hutzer in Caltech, that they are telling us what will be the, the right molecules, so the powerful molecules that would allow us to, to measure symmetry violating properties, even with a single molecular ion. So a lot of uh, uh, expectations for the next few years. And applications in astrophysics. So I just, I will briefly mention that I can all, always come back if you are interested. So, it was claimed that the first trajectory molecule was showing in space a few years ago, uh, but there are no laboratory studies to verify this. And now we are at the point that we will be able to study these trajectory molecules. And this is interesting because the, the, in the space is very cold, right? So, and a lot of our observation comes from seeing molecular lines because with very low energy, with very low temperatures, you can still excite molecules. And radioactive molecules, comparing unstable and radioactive molecules, can give you an idea of the, when this is when this phenomena happens. Price something like carbon dating, like, but you can use with different radioactive molecules. With that, I would like to go to the summary and outlook, right? So as I explained to you, there are different approaches to explore the nucleus, the, pre the energy frontier and the precision frontier. This is the main, the main uh, force of our group, right? Our main tools. So we are mainly working in this direction and we use atoms and molecules to kind of guide the electron inside the nucleus in a way that will allow us to explore a particular phenomena. And we modify the nuclei to enhance uh, the phenomena that, that we want to explore. 
So we have contributed with understanding the nuclear size in different, different regions of the, of, of the nuclear chart. So I presented you some of the, I didn't emphasize, but that was the first ever laser spectroscopy of uh, short-lived radioactive molecules. This is a field that is just starting, right? And there are other groups that are now that are working, have been working in, in the field as well. So it's growing and, and we need more clever students and, uh, that are joining this, these experiments and uh, pushing the field. So we have been measured now at the point that we can measure the hyperfine structure but there is a lot more work to jump into, into the business of symmetry violating properties. So molecules truly are expected to give us a, a new window onto the understanding of nuclei, right? Particularly the electroweak structure of nuclei that so far is poorly known. So properties like the anapon moment are just known or constrained for, for one or two systems. So it's really a, a region of, of, of properties that are so far are unexplored. And by modifying the nucleons, we can uh, provide this enhancement of this nuclear amplification that can be combined with the molecular amplification to really take the very best of all worlds. I showed you briefly an application in astronomy, why these developments will impact our fields and naturally we are building, or we are creating new forms of matter that are of interest for nuclear chemistry and quantum chemistry. So the best of all is that this is just the beginning, right? So we are just starting and there is a lot more to learn. And with that, I, I would like to end the presentation and thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ronald, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'd like to remind if, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, you can put them in the chat window or use the Q&A um, or the, uh, the raise hand feature. And uh, we do have a few uh, hands raised. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll say your name uh, and I will then allow you to talk and you can just ask your question directly. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first hand up is from Brad Philippone. And Brad, you should be able to talk now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, hi, Ronald. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, and please say hi to Alex for me when you get uh, when you're back in the lab. Uh, my question was on the um, the aluminum twenty six um, uh, fluoride uh, results. Did that include aluminum twenty six? Is a long lived gamma emitter. Was there detection of the gamma ray line as well as uh, atomic and molecular information? Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you, Brad. And I will say hello to Alex. So the, the problem that they highlight, so this is far from my expertise, but the group came to us and asked, okay, can you measure aluminum fluoride? So my understanding is it's very hard because gamma, so because the long lifetime, right? So it's, it's very hard to, to get the, infor the information from the gamma. So in that regard, so they can just not include. So, yeah, did that answer then the question? Yes, okay, so there yeah. was no cor cor uh, uh, corresponding right. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. The, yeah, and that highlighted why it's very important to, to measure that through a molecular lines. Right. Because even this very long leaf, you can just, in a space, even that is very cold, you are exciting them all the time. So the the identi identification in this regard was based on theory, and you see it, you need calculations that are very precise to define these lines. Although they argue that for these molecules they can constrain the the, the theory in, with good precision, once you go to more complex molecules, it's just impossible. So they came to us because in in environments that have water. So you expect aluminum hydroxide to dominate. And there the theoretical prediction is just impossible. You see uh, lines in, in their telescopes, but you can just not assign them. We measure that in the lab, then we can guide the astronomers to, to find these radioactive molecules. Yeah. Thanks. All right, our next question is from David Hitland. And you should now be allowed to talk or unmute yourself. Right, okay. I actually have two questions. 
Um, the first is when you add these nucleons, does it does the resulting nucleus always uh, start in the ground state? Is can't you have formation into an excited nuclear state? Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's also a very interesting question. The answer is yes. Yes, and this is extremely interesting for us. So let me just come here. So well, here I can start. So yes, uh, the, if the lifetime of this excited state is, is lower than, than microseconds, then they likely get de excited before we actually take into our experiment. So taking them to our experiment takes about one millisecond, depending on the, the experiment, right? So, but the study the properties of these excited states is, is very interesting. Isomers, mm -hmm. uh, they have many applications. And one here is, for example, the, the torium clock, right? This torium isomer. So we like to produce this at every and study the properties of, of this excited state of torium that was predicted to be good for, for a laser clock or a nuclear clock, sorry. Okay, the other question was, you showed this plot of um, adding neutrons and uh, at a certain point, they when they became very neutron rich, the nuclear size goes up. Right. And this, for example? Right, right. okay. So those, yeah. No, the next one. Yeah. That one. So these are all magic numbers. So outside of a closed shell, isn't that what you would expect to happen? It, let's say we expect an increase, right? So that we expected from previous observation, that's right. What we didn't expect is to have the increase equal for all of them, even the magics like calcium up to the very open shell like manganese or in all of these regions. So that was what it was unexpected for us. That all of them increase perfectly, almost with the same slope. And you love this kind of structure of the protons. Yeah, that was what it is. But indeed, across cell, we always see these kind of kings, but we just didn't know if they, all the kings have the same slope. That's what the intriguing part. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess I, from a very naive point of view, I would expect outside of a closed shell when there's lots of degrees of freedom that you would just, that kind of what would happen linearly. It, yes, but right. you, will, you will expect the same for regardless of the proton number, I mean the same slope. Well, I mean, they all have roughly the same, you know, by Gauss's law, sort of, they all have the same inside, so that's what happens outside. Okay, because the, the, the theory tell us that if you go to something like titanium, you have four protons really in an open shell, right? So you can imagine the calcium fourth is like the core and below you have just below this core and above you have a proton just going around. Mm -hmm. So somehow you are blocking all these possible excitations and you lost this, this structure. Yeah. I think that that part of the thing is, the, the puzzling thing is the simple trend you kind of can explain with a simple model, right? But then the same model doesn't work on the left. So consoling these, these two regions, I think it is it's what we cannot do yet. Yeah, that's it, satisfies the, Okay, anyway, it was yeah. just a naive question. No, no, but thank you very much. I think this is a very important question. And, and yes, so somehow you can say, okay, you add more pro neutrons and, and phenomenologically you can, okay, just expanding, maybe you lost the structure somehow. But quantifying that and, and doing a, a description, the same description that, that worked for here don't work well for here. At least not the, the slope or the size of the slope. Well, there is a question of um, when you're calculating the RMS radius of a, an assumed spherical distribution, if you have a permanent quadrupole deformation that changes 
the RMS radius. And the yeah. deformation away from a closed shell is changing. Right. Do yeah. you take that into account? Uh, okay, so from the from this, yes, so from the in the light region, this uh, this contribution is quite small. So we know this is lower than a few percent. So it's it's smaller than the uncertainty. Certainly the very heavy, that's important. And we need to correct that. And the way to do that now is either we use electron scattering data where it is possible or we need a nuclear curing. But yeah, thank you. So that definitely is important. All right, uh, we have another uh, raised hand um, from Aryan Jad Babai, and I will allow you to unmute yourself. So go Hi, ahead. Ronald. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question in the beginning when you showed the chart of the nuclei, uh, you showed how the theoretical progress has been <laughs> mostly in uh, magic nuclei. Uh, and I was wondering if you could comment on the prospects at all for uh, theory to kind of get beyond just these uh, magic nuclei and start simulating other things as well. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. So if I should say some theories, so now I love us to access to all of these nuclei. The problem is that quantifying the uncertainty of that or the, the uncertainty of the theoretical prediction is very hard. So the way as people are doing now is to, in particular these methods like immediate similarity in the normalization group. So what you are doing is basically use ab initio methods to kind of give the ingredients of the shell model. So you kind of calculate your effective single particle energies, matrix elements and so on. And now you have this like balance space. And what you do is you apply configuration methods or shell model like calculations. And with that, you can access to all of these new claims. So in that regard, there is already an advance and they are progressing towards that. But the, the main difficulties yeah, is the, the uncertainty of the results. But there is a lot of prospects. So in a short answer is correct. There is already a path and there are people working on it. And, and it is something that is evolving quite fast in the last few years as well. Yeah. All right, great. And uh, that gets us through the raised hands and brings us right to five o'clock. Uh, so I'll thank you again for a very interesting talk. Uh, and we look forward to having you on campus sometime, uh, hopefully soon. Yeah, thank you, Nick, and thank you all of you. So it was uh, my pleasure. All right. Thank you, Ronald, and thanks everyone else for coming and hope to see you next time.